Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. You've come to the right place. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. You know, I have long said that disagreements in a marriage are a given, but that fighting is a choice. Now, I know this is not a popular position. Even many of my colleagues promote the concept that fighting is really okay, as long as it's done in a quote-unquote fair way. Now, I have no disagreement with how they suggest couples should approach this fair way, but what I do have is a serious problem with giving couples permission to fight. So, given that couples struggle with disagreements and these disagreements often end up in arguments, is there anything that couples can do to minimize the damage? Well, in a word, yes. And Dr. James Creighton, psychologist, relationship consultant, and author of Loving Through Your Differences, Building Strong Relationships from Separate Realities, is here to talk about how to do that. So Dr. Creighton, Jim, thank you for coming on the show and talking about this ever necessary conversation that seems to be um, needing to be had multiple, multiple times. Good to be with you. I, I, so, I, think, I think the issue is whether disagreements are what start fights or whether fights are somehow a categorically different kind of thing. Hmm. Uh, in my experience, uh, everybody has disagreements and most people have fights And uh, having been married 53 years, uh, there have been times when my wife and I have been on the uh, the the fight end of the scale. So a lot of my search uh, in professionally has been what 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 can we do to help? Uh, What what keeps disagreements from turning into fights? Well, and I think that's really where I kind of start because what I talk about and. you know, when couples come to me and we're talking about things and I talk to various people about what it is I do and when they find out that I am a marriage coach and counselor, they either they start dumping on me or they go absolutely silent because they're trying to remember what they've said about their partner from in the last 10 minutes. But um, my, my position has always been that the biggest struggle cu- couples face is that they are now, have always been, and will always be two separate people. Now, somehow this seems to come as a surprise to most of us. Um, And then the challenge is, how do you deal with it? But you talk about the concept, which I think is something very similar to what I'm talking about, about separate realities. So how do you define this concept of separate realities? Well, I got into the concept because I could see there were times when I had an experience I'd go through an experience and I'd have one reaction. My wife would go through the same experience and have an entirely different reaction. Mm -hmm. And it was clear we were having separate experiences. Mm -hmm. And it really goes back to whether feelings are caused by externalities, things outside ourselves, (laughs) or whether feelings are caused by that external event plus the meaning that we bring to the event. So if uh, my wife and I go to a movie and I, I got a kick out of the film and she was bored to tears, she doesn't mm-hmm. like she doesn't like car chases, uh, <laughs> and we uh, we get out afterwards and I say, "Well, is that a great film?" And she can she can launch into something that ends up with uh, how adolescent I am to even have enjoyed that movie. And, wow. Uh, we, we both have made judgments about the movie and soon about each other, uh, where in fact my experience was enjoyment and her experience was boredom. And it's absolutely true, I enjoyed it, absolutely true, she was bored to tears. And both of those realities are completely com- completely accurate and, and real and so forth. And the job here is not one of my convincing her my reality is right or vice versa but of understanding each other's reality and then being able to find some way to accommodate it or even to come up with a shared reality 
Well, and I think that's a really important point because, and, and the, the point I really want to emphasize is that both of your, of your realities are correct. This is where I get into it when people will have this conversation, you know, they'll, they'll re fight the fight or re or you know, rediscuss the discussion in front of me and it's like you said this no I didn't yes you did and what I say to them is if you do not have a tape recorder or a video recording of this stop this because you did not experience that conversation the same way and then they turn around and look at me like I have three heads and it's like no because and it's and it's sort of like you and your wife going to this movie you you watched the exact same thing, but you took very different things away from it. And if we get into an argument about, about whose reality is right, of course we blow the evening and, and maybe the weekend. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> or longer. Yeah, yeah right. The, the, now, it depends some on how we communicate about it. Because mm-hmm. if I tell her that I was really bored, or she tells me she was really bored, mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I tell her uh, how much I enjoyed it. We, it's possible for both of those things to be true at the same time. If we get into the movie was good or the movie was bad, then two different judgments contradict each other. They're going to get in a war. And <laughs> so the one of the tricks is as you're getting into the, any difficult area that you share what your actual feeling is I felt hurt, sad, angry, confused, so forth. Instead uh-huh. of judgments, you're you're this kind of person, you're that kind of person. That was stupid. That was infantile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh-huh. Because the two feelings can coexist. Uh, two judgments battle with each other and make it very difficult to avoid getting into a fight. Well, and I think that the not judging. Um, is a critical component, and you know, and whether whether your wife thinks that you're enjoying the movie with adolescent, that that then becomes almost an attack. Well, that's not almost; it sort of is an attack on who you are as a person, and that somehow you know you're not you're no longer discussing the enjoyment of the movie. You're, it's now a personal. That's right, and it escalates from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the things I've tried to do in in the book is to specify what are some of the steps in escalation uh, Mm -hmm. with the hope that, first of all, we can recognize the steps and and stop doing them. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. uh, Second of all, uh, have some agreements, husband and wife partners, on, on... which behaviors we're going to avoid. Uh, now, what I mean by escalation is um, usually the first step of escalation is it moves from just a report of experience to a blame or accusation. Uh huh. Like just like you're adolescent for liking that movie. It's a, that yeah, then right. that becomes an a, an attack on your character. And I then uh, fire back with something that. Uh, is e- equally judgmental, and away we go. Mm-hmm. Hello. Hello. So is this so? Is this some of why the separate realities matter? Why why it is so important for couples to understand that they just have different experiences? Yes. Um, let me give you another separate reality thing because the, the movies kind of tried, but we can. Uh-huh. Uh, the things, whether it's raising kids or sexuality or mm-hmm. uh, spending Raising money. kids is a big one, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah those oh, yeah, there's another biggie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And so what um, – uh, this is an example that I saw where a, a, the husband had been raised in an immigrant family, and it had been drilled into him that he was to succeed and – he was to let other people know that he'd succeeded. Uh, but mm-hmm. The family put great, st- great store in showing face to the outside world and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, then she was raised in a family where uh, 
it was a working class family, and there were just things that working class people didn't do. It was rising, rising above themselves, uh, to, you know, trying to put put other people down and so forth and so yeah. on. Put, putting on ready. air, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. Yeah. Now they're getting ready to buy a car, and he would love to buy a Mercedes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be the ultimate in showing people that he had arrived and so forth. She, on the other hand, is uncomfortably even riding in a Mercedes. I mean, mm-hmm. that's really being above herself. And she just freaks out at the possibility of that they would actually own one. Now, obviously, the car isn't the problem. The Correct. Car, it, each, each one brings to that car a set of meanings, which makes it almost impossible to agree on a Mercedes. <laughs> now, it's possible that if they can be open and start sharing and so on, uh, either one of them might like to be liberated from the family rules about how you have to be and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're going to do some work to, to get there. Uh, you don't, first of all, you have to make it conscious, and you still probably have to do some work uh, to get over that kind of conditioning and so on. So, well, absolutely, but it's but it's a really good thing because but but chances are what's happening is that they're fighting about the car, which which of course then is going to keep them stuck if they don't understand that it isn't the car; it's their family history and their their, for lack of a better term, indoctrination into that family history. Right, and the and the only way to begin to move towards that is to share actual feelings rather than to share judgments and particularly to avoid blame and accusation and so on. Now, the escalation that would occur is after blame and accusation, then they expand the issue. Uh, Classic is the caps left off the toothpaste and then the next round is uh, this is characteristic of how irresponsible you are and, Mm -hmm. and, and so forth and so on. And the issue just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon, soon it's a universal, uh, you're an irresponsible person. Uh, there's no defense against that. I mean, what do you do except counterattack? Mm-hmm. And, and you're off and running. And then there's some other behaviors we engage in, like uh, using other people as ammunition. It's not just me that feels this way. Your mother said, said so forth and so on. Uh, the oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. They got together and took a vote and decided you're irresponsible. Uh, however, <laughs> it goes and so on. And pretty soon you're clear up to the top of the escalation ladder where the, the name of the game begins to hurt each other, either emotionally or even physically. Mm-hmm. And um, the only way I know to break that pattern is for either one or preferably both people to learn to recognize those behaviors and when you find yourself doing it just cut it out uh, but my, my wife and I have found that the best thing is to actually set some rules so mm-hmm. we, uh, we have a don't expand the issue that's, that's moving from the toothpaste cap to you're irresponsible that's expanding the issue uh-huh. or uh, don't use other people as ammunition Mm-hmm. And uh, several rules, because otherwise he comes to the situation with his family rules. She comes with her family rules, and you can somehow got to get from his rules or her rules to our rules. And the only way you can do that is with conscious agreements between the people who are involved. Right, ab- absolutely. And that's like I was talking about earlier about all of the the behaviors that go into quote unquote fighting fair are all very good behaviors. They're just, I just don't like them being put under that umbrella. To me, it's like, okay, let's just separate it out, and these are just behaviors we should be doing anyway. Um, This is Happily Ever After is just the beginning on webtalkradio.net. I'm Leslie Dorries, and I'm having a really important conversation about how couples can resolve conflicts with my guest, psychologist and author, Dr. James Crichton, And if you and your partner struggle with this very common challenge, I want you to know that there is a way out. It is possible to resolve conflicts in a way that supports both you and your relationship. And if this is something you would like to know more about, I encourage you to contact me today and schedule your free 
no obligation. Create your happily ever after transformation session. You can give me a call at area code 919-924-0463. Again, that's 919-924-0463. Or you can send me an email at leslie, L-E-S-L-I, at foundationscoachingnc.com. That's F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N-S, coaching, and is in Nancy, C is in charlie.com. Now, I want to get back because I did tell you that there's a way out of this, and I know that Jim has some, some things to help you, so I want to get back to talking to him. So, Jim, you specified um, 11 behaviors that couples can engage in to productively resolve these conflicts, and you kind of break them down into ones that somebody can do by themselves and those that kind of necessitate your partner's agreement. So what are some of the most important ones that somebody can do by themselves? Well, the first one, of course, I've already mentioned, which is to, to express feelings rather than judgments, accusation, blame, and so forth. So, um, but, but I want to be specified that that doesn't mean I feel like you're an idiot. <laughs> that, that's true, yeah. The, there is this little problem of people put... I feel in front of it, and then I feel right. you're a dirty rotten, so and so. Right. Yeah. Uh, that that doesn't count. No, it's 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 I feel followed by an actual feeling word, hurt, angry, sad, and so forth. And you mm-hmm. connect the feeling to a description of the behavior, or the circumstances, not a judgment of the behavior. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's it's I'm upset when the toys are left on the floor, not I'm upset when you're so messy. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the only word that the other person will hear is messy. And, right. Uh, or, or uh, and you, you're messy. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Now, now, I tell you what, I, I want to be sure to, to get in one emergency, uh, you know, when things really get bad and the other rest of this isn't working. One uh-huh. thing that uh, my wife and I found really makes a huge difference is something called the five-minute rule. Uh-huh. And this is one we agree on, and either one of us can say five-minute rule, and then nothing counts except who goes first, and flip a coin if you can't agree on that. And uh, that person gets five minutes to say whatever he or she wants any way they want uh, without any interruption, even even loud body language. Um, Ooh. In, in return for which the other person, uh, what I mean is I, I don't sit here and while you're saying something and show my total disapproval by frowns and Huffs and eye rolls and huff, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, I gotcha. Just, mm-hmm. just sit sit there and take it. In return for which, when we rotate, uh, the other person gets five minutes to say whatever he or she wants any way they want. And the reason it works is because usually, every twenty seconds or so, somebody's telling us we're wrong, we're bad, stupid, or crazy for feeling mm-hmm. the way we do. And our response to that is to just escalate and say it louder and stronger and more creatively. Mm -hmm. Uh, Five minutes is long enough that some of the steam goes out. In fact, uh, my experience is that at about four minutes, I'm beginning to bore even myself. Right. (laughs) I said it already. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you have to do a second round. Mm -hmm. Uh, But... Often it just ends. It, it may just end with, "Well, I've said everything I have to say," uh, mm-hmm. and so on. That's not a horrible place from which to uh, uh, begin to to mend things and put things together and so forth. Other times, one or the other of us will be willing to say, "Well, if I understand it, what you feel is blah blah blah," and, and summarize what what you mm-hmm. heard over those five minutes and so on. Uh, either way, one of us seems to be willing after five minutes to make some kind of conciliatory gesture and so on. Now, All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, t- I'm told that five minutes is enough time that the adrenaline of the fight burns off and uh, you, you're kind of settling down inside and so forth. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it has to be long enough that you, you, you have a feeling that the heat's gone out of what you had to say. So I just want to work that in because... With all the other wonderful skills and so on, things still get get really. Sometimes they, sometimes. yes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes with with the best of intentions, we we go off the rails. 
You have one um, recommendation that I think is really important. Well, actually, they're all important, all 11 of them. Um, but talking about listening, and you, put, and you phrase this as listening with both your head and heart, even though you may continue to disagree. And that, to me, is, is like, okay, can we put that in big lights, you know, flashing neon lights for people to pay attention to? What, I, what do you mean by listening with both your head and heart? Well, it's the difference between just knowing the content of what you said. Mm-hmm. You'd, you'd like a Mercedes because they're nice cars and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Uh, to hearing that she really is uncomfortable with it and there are reasons for that discomfort and you get into understanding her feeling for the the feelings that are under it and so on. Mm-hmm. So that it's not just you got the information from what she said. You also got some feeling, some some empathy for what's going on inside her. Uh, you okay. may not agree. Uh, you may may not even like what she said, and so on. But you can understand how a good person can still feel that way. And that's a that's that's a good deal of, of what the problem is. Is that once we get into these things, we stop thinking of each other as good people. And we, there, you, you become the enemy, and anything I do is justified because of what you just did to me, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and not only that, but I'm justified in doing it that way, which I think is we that that's sort of where I tell people my position of we're choosing to fight. I I am choosing to view you this way, as opposed to viewing you as a good person who, on this particular thing, I just disagree with. Well, that's the whole importance of the separate realities concept is mm-hmm. if you understand that it's inevitable that other people will arrive at different feelings in response to some of the same experiences uh, and that that's a result just of reality rather than that they're a bad person it totally changes the argument mm-hmm. uh, most of the arguments we get into are about com- trying to convince you your reality should be the same as mine exactly that uh, doesn't work real well. No, because, be, yeah, it's, um, it, it does. It creates all kinds of problems. So what are some of the, the solutions that require or that, are much, that require my partner to participate? Well, the role-setting uh, kinds of things mm-hmm. that I've talked about, uh, agreeing mm-hmm. on a five-minute rule, uh, agreeing mm-hmm. on avoiding behaviors that, that escalate, those kinds of things. And uh, when we talk about, later in the book, we talk about reframing a situation mm-hmm. to get from just his frame to her frame to our frame. Um, that may take quite a bit of work together to share feelings and, uh, and, and try to understand. It may even take having a third party there uh, to help keep some structure and present alternative ways of viewing the same situation. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Because, yeah, this is, it can get really complicated. And you know, there's some of these things that, that you talk about, and, and they're very interesting. And one of them is you talk about getting to know the different parts of your own personality and getting them talking to each other. So, when I read that, I thought, that's a really interesting concept, but what the heck does he mean? <laughs> okay. Well, I've, I don't know if you've ever observed this, but I've observed it when I see uh, couples together and they start to get into a, a fight, and it's almost like there's a personality change. Uh-huh. He, he suddenly gets really tight and rigid and judgmental and she maybe gets very emotional and reactive and so on. And mm-hmm. it, gender could flip and still be the same kind of thing going on. It's mm-hmm. almost as if this particular argument uh, touches on a, an aspect of their personality or a, a part of their self, if you will, that's mm-hmm. a little different. Uh, you can almost hear uh, the language change and they begin talking more formally or different and so on. 
And there is there is a school of therapy that actually believes these are genuine parts of self that need to learn to talk to each other, uh, and that they, uh, in fact, that some some people even believe that they may have different different genders than the person they're they're part of. Interesting. Uh, and uh, that you, know, you you can do family therapy, if you will, with the parts of your own self. Hmm. That's a, that's a really interesting concept. So, and there's, um, you know, you, these 11 that you have are all very interesting. And there, there's one that you use that use a problem-solving process that says we have a problem, not that you are the problem, which I think that's a really important way to approach something because if, and, and that's why one of, one of my hard and fast rules is try not to use the word you in the first three words of a sentence unless it's I love you, you're wonderful, I'm glad you're in my life. Um, because because all we hear is that you, and it's like, you know, if I could put it about me, I feel this way when this happens, or, you know, I'm not okay with this, can we find another way to do this? Because now I'm inviting my partner in to this. I'm not pushing them away by blaming them. Right, and I would also keep in mind the fact that you don't always have to do problem solving right when you're – when you've been in a fight, in fact, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's almost impossible to, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, s- s- separate it and so on. Because while you got all the, your body's all charged up and raring to go and so forth from a fight, um, you're, it's pretty hard for you to, to operate from we. You we know, tend to, at that point, to operate completely in self defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you get away from the fight a little bit and says, have, have a date to do the problem solving and so on, then you can say, you know, we have a problem. Uh, and it's not that you're a bad person. It's not that I'm a bad person. But there's still a problem that, that has to be dealt with. And that, right. begins, that begins to shift it. And I also I recommend a series of problem solving steps uh, because I find um, – if you if you know the steps and where you are in the problem solving process, it, it helps a lot to have that structure. It also helps a lot to keep the solution generating stage separate from the problem defining stage. Uh, you need to start out with a good problem definition of how we see the problem, and then you need to generate lots of alternatives. So you get away from his alternative, her alternative. And if you each have five or ten up there, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to have that same sense of possessing the right answer and so forth. And, well, uh, I love yeah, I, I love that because that's, I mean, a lot of times people are trying to solve a problem they haven't even identified yet. So just going back to the car example, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, we're we're trying to solve the problem before we've even identified it because the problem isn't really do we buy a new car. It's not even what kind of car do we buy, but what's underlying the choice of the car that we buy. <laughs> but if and we if, just and if there's a whole family, it's who got life left out last time and whose needs mm-hmm. aren't getting met and who feels. Uh, they're, they're not getting their fair share and oh. all that relationship stuff that uh, a car may or not solve. Right. And, and, and so it's one of the things that I tell people, if they seem to keep coming back to the same, you know, to the same conversation, to the same argument, to the same fight, then they need, they need to look for what those other inputs are, whether it's, you know, expectations, whether it's family culture, what, whatever it is, because there's always another reason why we're not resolving this. And, um, you know, I love, I love number 11 because it's really, it's really what I talk about um, with my clients is accept that differences can make your relationships richer. And I love that because we're all, you know, it's like somebody being different from me can make me uncomfortable but if I can look at it as a positive and want to learn more about it, then it's an asset. And I think that's what you're trying to say in that last, that last it, point. That's exactly it. Because as I, 
my life becomes richer if I understand other other ways of interpreting and experiencing life other than the one in my particular program. Um, mm-hmm. then, then I become a bigger person with more options and more possibilities. Which, which means we're growing, which I think is wonderful. So where can people find your book and any of the other in- wonderful information that you put out into the universe? Well, I actually have two websites. The one about the book is James L. Creighton, C-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-N dot com. And that describes the book, which is uh, Loving Through Your Differences, Building Strong Relationships from Separate Realities. Okay. Uh, I also have a webpage called publicparticipation.com, and this has to do more with my consulting work and uh, resolving conflicts uh, in, in, in society at large. Uh, probably the easiest way to get it, if you, you've got local bookstores, it should be there. Uh, if not, go to uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or IndieBound. Uh, I noticed that Amazon has a discount price and so forth. And uh, I welcome you to... Uh, read it and write in and send a review. It actually helps the author if uh, <laughs> you send in reviews and let them know what you think of it and so forth. Uh, so you just go to Amazon and, and then go for uh, loving through your differences. Terrific. So the damage that fights do to your relationship should never be underestimated. And while the damage might be able to be repaired, wouldn't it be better to not incur the damage in the first place? So hopefully you've gotten some direction on how to handle conflicts better because no matter how much you love your partner, no matter how much your partner loves you, you are going to disagree. That's a given. What we want to do is try to make those disagreements as painless as possible. So the question becomes, what do you need to do to take action? And hopefully one of those things will be to continue to listen to this show. And until next week, stay loving. Stay loving.